Three, two. The sliding down. Yeah, here he goes. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Done. Done. Look at that. Three twenty-four, so it's three twenty-seven. The center. They're just a little this way, so I'm gonna say it's three twenty-six. In today's video, we're going to go through a few of the different things that we use to make our long range shots happen, talk about power and terminal performance, and we're even going to touch on that dreaded word ethics. Stay tuned. Hey, bud. Yeah. What are we doing? Gathering dope. What should we do tomorrow? Gather more dope. <laughs> and then what should we do? Gather dope. Gather dope. <laughs> All right. Ready? Ready. Norm and I are on the phone here. He's 100 yards from the target, and I'm 300 yards. He has binoculars. I think you hit it. All right. One more. Oh, that was perfect wind. It's about uh, two and a half inches high. Okay, I see it. Coming again. Yep. He's hit, hit the same spot. Hit, hit that. Okay, and again. Yeah, oh, you hit the buckle right where you hit it the first time. <laughs> yeah. Behind every single shot you have ever seen us take is a hundred shots, a thousand shots. They really are limitless. We don't stop when we have our original drop data. We verify it over and over and over again and in changing conditions. One of the hardest things to get right is drop data in different temperatures with different winds. Winds affect the pellet or the slug up and down and there is just no chance of hitting your target unless you account for that. But to get that original dope, to get the idea of what you want to do in the first place, that comes from waiting for that perfect calm day or waking up first thing in the morning and getting that calm morning breeze that hardly exists at all and shooting at extended ranges and making the most of our time. We shoot from 50 all the way out to 350 usually, just trying to verify what should we expect on a perfectly calm day. Now we almost never get that calm day to shoot on, but that's our baseline and where we can start to make guesses at what will happen to the pellet or slug in a left or right wind. The secret here is that there is no secret. You just have to shoot every 10 yards all the way out to where you want to be done shooting. These ballistic programs are awesome, but they almost never work perfectly for me. I usually have to take my real data put it against the data that the computer puts out. And then I change ballistic coefficients and velocities and even bullet length sometimes or pellet length sometimes to make it line up with my real world data. Sometimes that means that I actually have to have two or three separate profiles for the same round and the same gun. And it'll be, you know, zero to 150 yards and then 150 to 250 so that I can change the ballistic coefficients in the program to make it line up. Now, if I have the real world data, what do I care about what the ballistic program says? Well, sometimes it can be really useful. Specifically, if you change locations and you head out to a place where the elevation is different or the weather is extremely different, those calculations that it does are a really good indicator of what I could expect on a day that is completely unlike the day that I got real world data. It's a tool in the toolbox, but it is not the end all sale. Now, if we start talking about long range hunting and not just long range shooting in general, then we need to start talking about power. I and Norm personally believe that a 30 caliber stock from the factory in MK2 has plenty of power and we've seen it over and over again. 
I've personally killed pigeons at 230 yards with the 44 grainers out of a stock gun and it just crushes them. Um, what I really want to talk about though is what if your shot isn't perfect and you place it on the margins. Um, my record shot was 327 and though it went through the body cavity, it was low in the body cavity. And some people really didn't like that, but the fact of the matter is that that gun, tuned up the way it was, had plenty of power to put that bird down. It flew about 30, 40 yards and crashed. Any vital shot, anything through the cavity should be expected to do that if the gun is producing as many foot-pounds as this is with soft lead slugs. You really have to be careful and pick your equipment wisely because if you don't make the perfect shot, you still want a quick humane kill. Yep, I said humane. And I get a lot of flack for that, and especially for shots like this. I shot this woodchuck directly through the heart, and while he of course ran off screen because I didn't disrupt the central nervous system, he was dead incredibly quickly and died just inside the grass. Now, a big game hunter would tell you that this shot was perfect. A pest hunter would tell you that I should have shot it in the head. They both argue with each other. Deer hunters say, never shoot a deer in the head, you might hit the jaw. Airgun hunters say, never shoot it in the vitals, it'll run away. You gotta shoot it in the head. Well, the same risks are involved with shooting woodchucks in the head as deer in the head, and I have no problem with either shot as long as you can comfortably make it. But when we talk about hitting woodchucks in the vitals, it's kind of the same as hitting a pest bird just about anywhere above the legs. We now have air guns that produce the amount of power needed to disrupt the organ cavity with any solid hit to the body. And while I might take some flack for saying that, I can tell you that over the thousands and thousands of air gun kills that Norman and I have amassed in just the last seven months, that is exactly the case. So as long as death comes swiftly, and the animal does not suffer unduly, then why would it possibly matter where we shoot it from? 50 yards, 300 yards, it really doesn't matter as long as the job gets done. And in our personal opinion, a 30 yard flight is no different than a perfectly shot deer running 50 before it crashes. Making wind calls is a bit of an art form. So the bad news is there's no way to learn that from reading a book or watching a bunch of videos. The good news is if you do it over and over and over again and practice at these extended ranges, it just starts kind of coming to you. Now that's the left and right part. The up and down part is a little more scientific. And what I know is that when I shoot slugs and the wind comes from the right, it lifts it, and when it comes from the left, it pushes it down. I'm not gonna get into the minutia of how that works, but I am gonna tell you a little trick I use. If the wind is below 10 miles an hour, I just say, the wind's coming from the right, it's gonna hit one MOA high. And if the wind's coming from the left, it's gonna hit one MOA low. Although that's not scientific and exactly right every time, it's better than calling for no wind at all, and it's not over calling it either. So. I take that rule and apply it, and it works out more often than not. Now, of course, to get that kind of consistency that you can count on, you need a gun that's perfectly tuned. And this scene is from one of our videos that we made about how we tuned a 30 cal pellet gun. And what you really are looking for is that the gun just works in harmony. If you don't start there, then it's kind of impossible to stretch out the range. In harmony can be done at a bunch of different ranges, but let's take this example at 50 yards. Eventually it gets boring shooting at 50 yards because the hole is not going to grow anymore. It's going to stay the exact same size. And with that kind of result, you can start to push out further. If that was a shotgun pattern at 50 yards, there's really no hope of getting it to go out further with consistency that you're looking to hit a two to three inch target. And when we start to talk about tuning the guns, we need to touch on equipment, at least for a moment. And although it's no secret that Norm and I are FX fanboys, it can really be done with most of the high quality guns that are out there, whatever you prefer. I don't care if it's an FX Impact or a Day State or a Raw. 
But what I am saying is that if you want to stretch out this far, it's my personal belief that you're not going to get it done with anything stock that's on the lower end. Like a Marauder, although a great gun, it's not designed to push out this far. The same holds true with optics. You are simply not going to be able to get the repeatability in the turrets with a budget optic. If you're looking to push out to the absolute limit of the gun and then beyond it a bit, you really need to take advantage of some of the better technology out there. I'm not going to go through listing brands, but I think you can watch our videos and gather what we think are the best tools for the job. The ability to turn your turret all the way up to, let's say, 100 MOA and then crank it back down to zero 50 times in one day and have it be exactly where you left it is absolutely necessary to make shots like we're making at extended distances. And it's no secret that optics are needed. As a matter of fact, most people in the long range world would suggest spending at least double on your optic what you spent on the gun. Of course, that rule comes from powder burners, which are much cheaper in general, but I look at the thousand dollar barrier as a pretty real thing and I don't mean to tell you that you absolutely have to spend a thousand dollars. What I'm trying to tell you is there is jumps in quality and when you go from 300 to a thousand it's huge especially on repeatability and if you want to choose to go with a lower range scope you can still shoot long but I would use something that's more reliable in that system like the reticle itself and that of course poses problems when you're holding for wind but it is doable and again i'm not trying to spend all of your money i'm simply saying that somewhere near a thousand dollars seems to be the limit in my experience where the turrets truly become reliable and we're just not able to do the shots that we do without that kind of consistency. Now I know people shoot iron sights very, very far, but they're not talking about placing a small projectile on a pigeon um, at these distances. So buy the best optic you can afford, and the same thing goes with the gun if you're trying to push out this far. I'll get off my soapbox. Hopefully you guys got to pick up some tips from this week's video and at the very least have an understanding of our thought process and how we feel about what we do. Until next time, we're out. Yeah, buddy. That curled in perfect. Thanks. Three, two. Done. Done, done.